Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to Blake Bell and Michael Vassilo, co-authors of the new book, The Secret History of Marvel Comics. Stick around. In case of emergency, the invaders are standing by to rescue us all. So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media Interview, brought to you by Amazon.com, Audible.com, and 1-800-DIAL-DJs. Please stop by the website, MrMedia.com, click on our advertisers, support the show. And remember, there's more than a thousand interviews available at MrMedia.com. We've been doing this since February 2007. Hope you'll find something you like. And thanks for listening. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of poorly compensated, rapidly disappearing World War II era writers and artists hoping against hope that a court will decide on copyright claims in their favor before they... Oops, too late. In the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Everybody's got their secrets. Why, in 1976, this one time in band camp, I... Well, you get the point. So why would it be that hard to imagine that a gigantic publishing house might have a few skeletons in its closet? That's the allure of The Secret History of Marvel Comics, a big new book by Blake Bell, author of Fire and Water, Bill Everett, The Submariner, and The Birth of Marvel Comics, and Strange and Stranger, The World of Steve Ditko and Michael Vassilo, an expert on Marvel Comics from the 1930s to the 1950s. Secret History delves into the business practices and trickery that established and grew the hydra-headed publishing empire of the late Martin Goodman, the tight-fisted, often unpleasant gentleman responsible, nonetheless, for giving the world his talented and far more charming nephew, Stanley Lieber. And you probably know him better by his pen name, Stan Lee. The book is packed with details of Goodman's often unseemly practices, lack of appreciation for the many artists and writers he employed at slave wages, and the fact that he never did understand what made his one true and enduring success, Marvel Comics, succeed. Secret History, incidentally, covers quite a different chunk of time than Sean Howe's 1960s-centered book, Marvel Comics, The Untold Story, but collectors will probably be interested to read both. Uh, by the way, you can meet the authors alongside comics artist Al Jaffe, who's been on the show, and Stan Goldberg at the official book release event on Saturday, October 12th at 7 p.m., hosted by the Society of Illustrated, Illustrators, located at 128 East 63rd Street in Manhattan. Blake Bell and Michael Vassilo, welcome to Mr. Media. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Delighted to see you. Uh, congratulations on the book. Um, Guys, what would you say are some of the, without giving away too much, obviously, what are some of the key secrets of the secret history of Marvel Comics? I mean, what will surprise even the most ardent his, uh, fans of comics history? Bob, I think there's two halves to, to the book and there's two halves to the secrets. Uh, one half, of course, is the business aspect of Martin Goodman, which has never really been delved into. And, of course, the other half is the artists and the artwork that we uncovered that pretty much have never been seen. I would agree with Michael. The, the fascinating part about the book is that all these artists for Marvel Comics in the golden age of Marvel back in the late 1930s and 1940s, they were all moonlighting at Martin Goodman's other enterprises that he had, the pulps and the magazines. And he began those businesses a long time before he became Marvel Comics. And as we discuss in the book, Really, Marvel Comics was just one industry uh, or one publication base that he had. And all of the other uh, publishing endeavors that he tried before Marvel Comics, he really, as Michael said, took the business practices from those um, endeavors and put them on to Marvel Comics. 
And that's why you saw some of the history play out between those key players like Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, and Steve Ditko. All of those business practices were in play long before he started at Marvel Comics. It would be interesting, wouldn't it, to have seen Goodman trying to operate the same way during the Internet age when information is so available and it's so easy to dig up you know, corporate, corporate history and corporate uh, registration? That's true, uh, except that some of those business practices are still going on in a lot of corporate America and also in publishing. So, No, come on, that can't be true. <laughs> well, we see this, we still see today many of the battles, uh, creator versus the, the corporation. Uh, we just saw Gary Friedrich recently settle uh, with Marvel Comics, but that was after a long, prolonged battle. We saw Marv Wolfman, we've seen we, you know, the Kirby industry, Siegel and Schuster, and you can trace all of that back to the godfathers of publishing who started in the, the pulp industry. All those, all those original comic book publishers, the Donafelds, the Goodmans, they all started in, in pulps and magazines before their comic book industries. And as we discussed, some of the practices they were doing then still left scars all the decades down the way. Now, I, it, I, I think I, I need to point out uh, that there really hasn't been a book about those guys written where they come off as good guys. I mean, even uh, Michael Chabon's uh, uh, book, uh, The uh, uh, Amazing Adventures of uh, Cavalier and Clay, I mean, they don't come off good, and that's fiction, and they come off badly there. So my question is, um, what, what, what did you guys find out that surprised you and that will surprise readers about these guys that has not been published before? I would say that I think that it, uh, it was really a wild west of publishing back in the late 20s and the early 30s. They were really making it up as they were going along, and they, the publishers, I say, uh, for example, they would they would set up one company, and when they didn't want to pay the writers or artists, they would shut it down. Often maintaining the same editorial staff, but just changing the company to a, a different name, even sometimes in the same location, and starting up this new venture and leaving everyone else in their dust. So definitely it was fascinating to see those types of activities play out. And to, to one, quickly to one of your points, uh, Bob, is that the book, I think, does do a, a decent job, especially in the last chapter, of really looking at both sides of Martin Goodman. What did, what did he do well? What was he a product of his times versus some of those uh, negatives that you're speaking of? So I think it's, we, we do our best to give a, a balanced approach, but it definitely was the Wild West of publishing back in those days. Bob, a lot of those publishers, not a lot, actually all of those publishers were really in the business of just selling paper. It didn't matter what they were putting in the paper, if they could catch a trend and get it to the newsstands and sell half a million copies or whatnot. Um, Martin Goodman was no different from Harry Donenfeld or, or Hugo Gernsback or any of the publishers. They were basically creating it as they went along and flying by the seat of their pants. I guess the biggest surprise to anyone would be that there was anyone uh, who did care about the quality in any of this paper product. That you know, it, the, the stories we always hear is that uh, the money was made in distribution. It was how much paper and how many magazines. When the pulps died, there was this great rush to create product to replace them. That's where comic, comics came in, new fun and, and, and things like that. That They were just trying to uh, uh, create things uh, to fill the space that was being left. Uh, the, the comic books sort of came from, they were reprinting the old comic strips. They were just packaging them all up and then over and over again. Um, all right, so, so let me ask you this. So who was this guy Martin Goodman? I mean, certainly you, anyone who knows anything about Marvel Comics has probably heard the name, but maybe hasn't uh, you know, read a book yet about them. Maybe they will now. Um, you know, what, what, what can you tell me good? What can you tell me bad about this guy? Well, it, Bob, it's not a, obviously a warts and all biography. I mean, we didn't have access to the family or anything like that. We we're really looking at the origin of Martin Goodman, uh, which has never really been delved into. You know, uh, I had access to trade journals that tracked him along, and uh, we put it down in paper for the first time. Hmm. Yeah, I would say to follow up on that point, you're really looking at at a man who 
was born to double digit children who really dragged himself out of nowhere. He had parents who were first, um, they came over on the boats, of course, to New York, and he pulled himself up out of nowhere, got into publishing, and you know made a small fortune at it. So definitely you can say that uh, it was a bit of a rags to riches story, again, very little education by all accounts. So from, the, from that perspective, he would be considered one of the American success stories. Now, again, as we've seen in comic books over the years, sometimes you know, they're standing on the shoulders of those creators who actually gave their intellectual property and got back nothing for it. So when we look at you know, the balance of Martin Goodman, uh, those are the things you have to weigh out. Uh, you know, now that we have some history and some perspective, we see some of the scars that have been on the industry for so long and are still playing out today. So, you know, he was doing what everyone else was doing at the time, and he made a lot of money at it. People like Stan Lee in the book talk about how he wish he wished Martin would take it to another level because Martin did spend a lot of time chasing trends and then dropping them as quickly as they came. So, as an innovator. I think it really speaks to that point you made earlier, Bob, about that dichotomy between the corporate and the creative. The fact that these uh, corporate publishers were just moving paper, as Michael said, the fact that any artistry came out of that, that the Jack Kirby's of the world, the Bill Everett's of the world, the true artists were able to put their heart and souls into the sequential artwork of the comics, but also you see for the first time in this book, these fantastic spot illustrations that they would do for these pulp stories. I mean, it is unfiltered Jack Kirby. It is unfiltered Bill Everett. They're really do. They're really knocking it out of the park as opposed to being stuck in the the formulaic uh, genre of comic books. So you see some of their their the best they have to offer, and that's that's runs right across the board. That was one of the most surprising things for me about the book was just the the crap these people put into this material that they would never see again. You know, and then they never thought anybody would be researching 70 years down the road. <laughs> yeah, well, well, and I want to ask you about that. Um, the, uh, you know, I read through some of the source material uh, in the book's footnotes, and I have to admit, I did not read every page of it because I'm reading it on a PDF on the computer, and it's just a little, <laughs> it's a little challenging to read that kind of detail this way. So I apologize uh, that I, I couldn't read every bit of it, but... What I wondered is, uh, did you guys conduct many uh, original interviews for this, or, or where, I guess, where does the information come from? Bob, there aren't too many people left still alive to conduct uh, original interviews uh, with. Most of the information came from the trade journals, uh, Writer's Digest and Author and Journalist, of which I had access to going back into the 1920s. These were journals that were on the newsstands to help prospective writers uh, see what was out there and available to them from the uh, the book the, the book publishers and the pulp publishers and the magazines that were on the stands at the time, and pretty much that's the only place where this kind of information was being tracked: who the editors were, what the addresses were, when they moved, the changes in addresses, and all of these trade journals on a month by month basis tracked all this information. And pretty much, you know, out of all the comics history books I've ever read. Very few people have ever accessed these trade journals before, so uh, I'm pretty proud of the types of research we did on this. Yeah, I think what's what's been fascinating for me is that as we were researching the book originally, we went back and read accounts of Marvel uh, from various books, and it was amazing how many myths were just repeated over and over again. Whereas we went right back to the, the, the context of the times, right back to those trade journals and other uh, publications and dug out the true stories as it were happening. And we were really, one of the best things about this book is that it does shatter all of those myths that you may have heard and read about Marvel Comics. And we were also able to get uh, other sources, like the Federal Trade Commission was a fascinating source to see how many times Martin Goodman got pulled up on the carpet called up on the carpet for these business practices that uh, the FTC did not appreciate and nor did uh, other trade publications who were really representing writers and editors as Michael said they didn't appreciate it very much either so it was just fascinating just to see all that playing out in real time versus just replaying old myths that had no basis in fact have never been sourced we were able to cut through all that and give people the first true uh, accurate history of the origins of Marvel Comics it was. I'm sorry, Michael. Did you want to add something? 
Yeah, I was going to say that the letter pages to these trade journals were, were, were incredibly fascinating. Uh, editors of a lot of the other pulp companies would be writing in and slamming each other back and forth, uh, telling the editor of the, say, Writer's Digest, for example, that they don't engage in those types of bad business practices, and it's a, uh, a real stain on the industry, on what either Goodman was doing and Louis Silverfleet was doing. And uh, this type of stuff has never really been out there before. And I'm thinking somewhere down the line and maybe doing something else uh, to shed even a little bit more light on exactly what was in some of these trade journals. Yeah, I, I, that was one of the most interesting things to me. I've read a lot of uh, early comics history, uh, uh, probably more than I more than I care to admit at this point over the years. But I thought that was really, really interesting that you had that the FTC actually had complained and come down on Goodman because we really don't think about about them in the 30s or 40s being that active. It's it was not known as a very consumer protective uh, culture uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, certainly in the 40s, there were other uh, the, the minds of Americans were certainly elsewhere, um, and you know the 30s, you know the depression was still looming heavily. So it, I thought that was really interesting that you guys got into that. Um, did. Um, did you did you draw on uh, uh, fanzines at all? Interviews from fanzines, um, where where maybe some of these uh, uh, people had been interviewed over the years, like in the sixties no. and seventies. No, not really. Um, like I said, very few of the uh, particulars who we were concerned with. Martin Goodman, except for one unpublished interview, had never ever been interviewed, mm. which I think is actually a real shame and a loss to history, since he did survive into the early nineteen nineties. Interesting. Um, Stan uh, Stan Lee is a kind of stuck to the company line all these years, even with uh, his uncle Martin Goodman being gone now for three decades, I think maybe something 90. like that. Yeah, ninety. 90 okay, so 20, 20 plus years. Um, have you seen him over the years uh, being giving any information? That's kind of contrary to the old line. Well, one thing about uh, Stan, at least with regards to what our book is about, is that, and, and I've spoken to him, uh, he said that he had pretty much no knowledge of what Martin Goodman was doing outside of the comic book division. So if I queried him on information about pulps, even pulps in the 1940s when Stan was there at Timely, he really had nothing to say about it. I think that he had his little fiefdom there at Timely, and he didn't know. He didn't even actually know that Martin Goodman had a brother that passed away in 1937, who was one of the editors of the Pulp Line. I was pretty much the first person to tell him that. Now, one of the, one of the great parts though, about the book is that when we spoke to Stan, we finally got him to untangle his entire family history and his connection to Martin Goodman, because everyone says he's a blood relative, he's this, he's that, but Stan gave us the real goods for this book, so you, you can read our book and find out just who, how Stan Lee is related to Martin Goodman. It will surprise you. <laughs> okay. And well, so, so that comes back to my earlier question. So you did interview Stan for the book. I wouldn't it call wasn't it a formal, it, it yeah. wasn't a formal interview, Bob, but I have access to him, and I got questions to him, and he gave me answers. Okay. All right. Well, so and, that's... Yeah, and, and also, I interviewed Stan and his wife for my very first book, I Have to Live With This Guy, so <laughs> both of us, he was very open to helping in any way, shape, or form he could with this book. And, Blake, uh, this question, I guess, is more for you. Uh, having written the, uh, the Bill Everett book and the uh, Steve Ditko book, now, these are both guys who... Or would certainly fall into the, the class of guys who were, let's say, undervalued by Marvel Comics over the years, uh, who did not, you know, collect on, on the ultimate value of their creations. Uh, did you come into a book like The Secret uh, History of Marvel Comics with any kind of axe to grind on, on behalf of those guys or anyone else? Uh? No, the, the concept uh, of the book really started when... I was down in Michael's basement where he is right now in upstate New York and Michael started showing me all of these Martin Goodman publications that he had been accumulating in the last five to ten years and he really started showing me the, the artwork from all these moonlighting artists of Marvel Comics and at that point I said, wow, that would make a great book, The, the Secret History of Marvel Comics. So it became, that was the genesis of the book, was really to show that. And it was only through the research of the book that we started to see some of these business practices that Goodman had employed at Marvel Comics actually had 
um, began at these other publications prior to Marvel Comics. And in that regard, we talk about um, taking author's work and republishing it in his pulps and magazines, but changing character names, changing author names, not publishing copyrights. And again, this is where the FTC uh, stepped in. But it was certainly more. It certainly began more as an examination of the artwork in that time, and then it became a little more about Martin Goodman's business practices. But as I mentioned in that last chapter, we really try to give a, a fair and balanced approach to Goodman. And you know, as far as Steve Ditko, I mean, if, if he, he can grind his own axe, so he doesn't need me to do it for him. And the Everett family, you know, they, they could have joined the Kirby lawsuits. Uh, but they had no interest. They had made their piece and really didn't feel it was worth going back uh, that far. So from our perspective, it was really just more about making sure we chronicled that early history of Marvel Comics accurately and sourcing it in what you, you talked about that, Bob, the, the last section of the book, which I called the never-ending notes uh, <laughs> because they could have been a book onto themselves. Yeah. Just. Uh, all the details and all the source material that we, we pulled this information from because it was really important for us to make sure that we got all the facts that we could get that if we had something that was speculation that we made sure we didn't elevate it to the level of fact as some previous uh, tellings of the history of Marvel Comics have been so that you know we can walk away from this book saying you have exactly what you should have. Bob, the end notes are actually an edited version of the original end notes. <laughs> uh, we just had to put a cap on it because there can only be a certain amount of pages in the book, and we didn't want to take artwork out. Well, and, and I, I, I wish you guys great, great luck with that part of things because from my own experience uh, writing about comics and being exposed to the audience and being a, having been a comics reader and a comics fan back my entire life, uh, I know that comics fans are as brutal an audience as uh, political junkies. They question everything. They will challenge everything. So the fact that you, you have those uh, end notes in there, those uh, footnotes, uh, is to your credit, I think, because you know they're gonna they're they're all gonna come after you for for every little thing. Bring it on! Bring it on! <laughs> Bob, I mean, one thing I have to say about that is uh, there's uh, I'm thinking one or two things that uh, people might come out or a person might come out and, 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 and question. But pretty much we I think we ended up pioneering the Martin Goodman history because very little has been published, researched and written about. And I mean we had access to every comic history book ever written and, and what we found on Martin Goodman ended up a lot of it being incorrect. So this is I mean people can come after us and dig a little deeper maybe, although I dare say it might be a little difficult and maybe someone will do a warts and all biography. But um, uh, there's not very much they can find that's uh, actually wrong because every single statement we make is sourced. It's funny that you mentioned words and all. I was just going to bring up uh, Drew Friedman's father, uh, Bruce J. Friedman, who you, you reference and uh, who, who I had on the show uh, talking about his uh, autobiography, which I do not have in front of me. I believe it's called Lucky Guy. Um, and he talked about working for Martin Goodman and being there with Mario Puzo, and uh, very interesting. I don't know if, if if you reference that in your in your research, but we do. He has he has very good uh, he had very good stories to tell. I'm, I'm going to hold talk. up something. Okay. This is this is uh, focus. This is Swank. Uh, people are pretty familiar with Swank magazine. Well, this is the very first issue of Swank. It's a little tiny pocket magazine, mm. and Bruce Bruce J. Friedman was the editor on this. Mm -hmm. And I think what's fascinating the, of the accounts of Bruce J. Friedman is what Stan Lee talked about that we referenced earlier, which is Bruce J. Friedman trying his best to elevate them from a lowbrow publisher into something a little more uh, prestigious and how him and Goodman would always go back and forth on how much you have to pay to get quality and of course for Goodman it was always what's the maximum profit I can get out of the lowest investment mm. and so it's, it's fascinating to hear Friedman struggles with that as if he didn't know who he was dealing with but I guess he got a, a short, uh, <laughs> short course, pretty quick course on, on who he was dealing with at the time. It's interesting to see the, uh, the names on some of the covers of uh, I want to say Swank and maybe Swag because they would list people who had contributed and, and I kind of wonder if they were people who contributed or people whose material that Martin or Bruce just grabbed but uh, Jack Benny was actually listed on one of the covers I saw and that made me laugh. I, I actually 
no one knows this but my wife, but I actually go to sleep every night listening to an episode of the Jack Benny, uh, the old radio show. So I like the show myself. Yeah. It, it, talk Jack about Benny who? Jack, oh, shut up. Uh, Blake's too young. Speak, speaking about uh, clever writing, it doesn't get much better than that. Um, I was uh, Come back to the topic of Stan Lee for a minute. So uh, Stan uh, had his own little fiefdom. It doesn't seem like anyone has really come up over the years – uh, with a smoking gun connecting Stan to uh, a lot of Martin's policies, and he just seems to be have managed to stay apart from it over the years. Uh, uh, is that still the case? There, well, what, what I think is is once Stan was able to pretty much show that he was able to run the show over there and successfully, Martin left him alone, mm. and then Stan ran the show for the next thirty-five years. Stan just and still was not able to give creators their due financially, but he certainly gave them respect and he made yeah. household names out of them. He did. Well, I think once I think once Martin Goodman was selling the company uh, off in 1968 and then eventually left in 72. I think it became incumbent upon Stan as as the the face of Marvel Comics to to maintain that face to maintain that corporate perspective on the fact that it was the corporation that was successful, it was the corporation that had the intellectual properties and so it didn't behoove him at the time to emphasize the creator's impact especially because Steve Ditko had left you know and by 1966 he was gone off Spider-Man by the time Martin Goodman was finally out, Jack Kirby had been gone for a couple of years so it didn't make corporate sense at that time to be playing up these individuals who they had already taken the intellectual property from and were profiting off it uh, to now by the tune of billions but as history has unfolded there is certainly that veneer uh, from a public perspective that Stanley is the creator of this and the creator of that and he's unfortunately at, at times um, pursued that agenda uh, but now with the internet and all the access and all the interest that has gone into digging up all the history like our book does uh, we've certainly been able to hold up those creators and lionize them as the people who really drove uh, what was making the money. It was really the intellectual property that was making the money and you still see that today. They continue to mine that intellectual property, that new movie X-Men Days of Future Past. They're mining Chris Claremont and John Byrne's story. The new Wolverine movie, they're mining Chris Claremont and Frank Miller. Uh, so that's what this book also highlights is that you really see the, the those creators doing work that you've never seen them do before because they just loved doing the work and they had no expectations and not a lot of business sense to put their legal entitlement stamp on that work and you know it's it's gone from them and now it's only voices in fandom and historians who bring this uh, stuff to light well and uh, let me ask you and, and and Blake I think we may have talked about this when we talked about Steve Ditko a few years ago but were guys like Ditko and Joe Simon, Bill Everett, Jack Kirby, all those guys, were they entirely blameless in their exploitation by guys like Goodman or the Donenfields? I mean, they worked in the comics industry for many years. I mean, how many times did they have to sell their work for next to nothing with no enduring creator rights before they could have sought legal counsel or just given up and moved to another industry? Well, the only place well, you could have moved, oh, get ahead, Blake. So when you, well, I think when you read the early chapters of our book, you really get the sense that the culture that these publishers created, uh, the parameters of the industry, they knew what they were doing. They, this wasn't, you know, when Siegel and Schuster came along with Superman, it wasn't just a publisher who didn't know what he was doing and, and creators who didn't know what they were doing. And then all of a sudden, ooh, Superman became a big success and then they took it away from them. These publishers were putting these business practices into play long before the comic book industry came along. So they really knew what they, they were doing. Uh, as, and so that's sort of like blaming you know, the victim who gets run over both ways on a one-way street. Uh, sure, you can sit there and say that an artist like Jack Kirby, who knew nothing but drawing, and that was his whole life, his whole love, and you can say, well, you shouldn't have come back to Marvel, you shouldn't have done this, you shouldn't have done that, but does that really excuse uh, what was going on and what they were being taken advantage of and and did it and why did it take people like Neil Adams 
to shame uh, DC Comics and Warner Brothers, I believe, at the time, when those first Superman movies came out in the late 70s to give a, you know, a meager pension to Siegel and Schuster and their families. Like, why does it take that kind of activity still going on today with Gary Friedrich trying to get, you know, some rights to, to Ghost Rider when he is also in a physical condition that is, is really unfortunate? You know, it shouldn't take all of that. So when we... I don't like to put a lot of blame on the victim, you know, because they may, you know, they just did work for hire at the time, and and there were a lot of promises made, you know, a lot of promises made that that weren't kept, and that goes all the way back to the beginning, like we document in the book. Hmm. I don't, I mean, and and you know, I'm I'm sympathetic to all of their causes as somebody who writes for a living and relies on royalty income, and you know, uh, that type of thing. However, I do think back, and I think that okay. I can understand in the 30s and maybe the 40s that they they sold their work and they didn't they they didn't think or they were young and they you know they didn't attach some value to it. They could certainly see with Superman, as you say, when that started, there was the Superman uh, radio show, there was the serial, there was Superman underwear. It was all the stuff that we're familiar with now. Uh, you, you 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 mentioned that Martin Goodman sold the rights to Captain America. Uh, well, he didn't even sell them. Apparently, he just gave away the rights to make a, uh, a Saturday morning serial to Captain America because he thought he would sell more copies of the comic. He apparently was not sophisticated enough, or didn't 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 understand what was happening over at uh, National Comics with Superman to understand that it was a big profit center, or it could be. Uh, so apparently, he wasn't that sophisticated at that time. But so I, I you know I just have to ask. There were guys. I mean. Uh, uh, I, Will Eisner maintained the, his rights, but he was in a different setup. Although Kirby worked for him uh, early on and could certainly, you know, see how that was set up. Although, again, uh, it wasn't that Eisner gave Kirby the rights to the work that he did either. So, I don't know. I, you know, the question has to be asked. But so now, along well, that, a lot of these, Bob, a lot of these artists got in as kids, and they certainly uh, were not business people. I mean, look, somebody like Bob King got a lot of help early on. If I remember correctly, maybe his father helped him out, got a lawyer or something, and he was able to latch on to a degree of not ownership, but at least a lot of profit and recognition over the years for Batman. So, I mean, there are exceptions, as you say. And so let me ask you about this, as we're still talking about the business side of this a little bit. Uh, the essence of capitalism, of course, is buy low, sell high, which was the Martin Goodman approach, as you describe it. Minimum investment, maximum return. Does that make him, uh, you know, 60, 70 years ago, 50 years ago, any different from today's media magnets? I mean, guys like Rupert Murdoch or even Jeff Bezos, isn't that still the way that they, they run a media uh, empire? Yes, I don't think there's any difference whatsoever. And you could argue that they're, they will, the way what capitalism's turned into these days, they're, they, if you took away any of the, the, the barriers right now to squeezing the life out of... Uh, the people who produce the intellectual property, you see that in every industry. So they're, you know, they're standing on their own, you know, the shoulders of the own publishers, the the giants that came before them as well. So no doubt that they would also take advantage of creators, uh, and and do in many instances that we see today. There's still that lure. There's still that lure to, hey, I want to work on Spider-Man. Oh, you're going to pay me this page rate, and I'll invent this villain, and I'll never make any money off of this, this, and this. That still goes on today, and and people still get dragged into that. They get pulled into that, and they just don't realize the consequences of what they're doing until all of a sudden some book or some villain puts in some Avengers movie, and you know they don't they don't get a phone call or they don't get their phone calls returned from the the corporations who do it. It's interesting that the newer comics companies, uh, I, I'm thinking of Image in particular, I don't know how they all, all of them operate, but the newer ones seem to build in to their business plan that they would pay uh, creators uh, uh, royalties on, on things. And if they sell to film, that they'll sell, they'll, the creators will get rights, whereas the older companies are coming around to that, but not the same way. And book publishers, this is interesting to me, because someone who works on books, and you guys have a book out here, obviously, and Blake has two, two more before it. Um, the traditional book publishers are paying uh, 15, 20% royalty on ebooks, where they don't have the same physical costs that they do on, on physical books. And they're starting to see the, the the downside of that policy because 
I can go or you can go and publish your ebook yourself and get a 70% royalty from Amazon. Well, this is what people like Martin Goodman never realized from the beginning is that collaborating with the people that produce the intellectual property does stand you in a much greater stead to elevate your potential earnings because if they take away the, the creativity, their creative minds and move it to image in these other companies, then you've lost that. And that's one of the juxtapositions that talks about in the book and Stan talked about in the book was the notion that if Goodman had taken more chances and, and tried to innovate a little more and perhaps worked with the talent a little more than simply just chasing trend X, Y, or Z until it ran out of gas, who knows what heights he might have achieved even beyond that. Stan laments about that a bit in the book. Mm. Um, Blake, I want to ask you a question. I, I'm, I'm not entirely comfortable with the question. I will tell you that ahead of time. Uh, My favorite. But, okay. Well, here's the thing. In the acknowledgments, you refer to your Christian faith and here on the video, uh, for people who are listening on the audio only, they won't see this, but in, in the video, you're clearly wearing a, uh, a cross around your neck, which I completely respect and, and appreciate. But I want to ask you this. Uh, Martin Goodman published a lot of magazines such as Swank and all this other material. There's a lot of uh, bondage and S&M. And there's there's uh, satanic images, if you will, and hell and... Um, I was reminded of a book uh, that, that Craig Yo published, another collection. It was uh, Secret Identity, uh, The Fetish Art of Superman's co-creator, Joe Schuster. Um, and I wondered if, uh, if your faith at all is challenged by yourself being responsible for publishing a lot of the, these images in your book. Was that uncomfortable for you or just for me to ask about? No, it was definitely... It was a definite challenge, and I certainly ruminated that over the time. What is the responsibility of a historian versus what, where do you land as a Christian on the types of material, some of the material that's shown in the book? Are you promoting the material by putting it in a historical context in the, in the life and the professional history of a Martin Goodman? Uh, or is, is that just what it is? Do you have... A responsibility to that, uh, to that, um, that idea and the scope of the book, and so it was definitely a, a challenge to, to put that material in there and and take a look at it. But I don't. I think if you covered it up, that almost makes it worse and almost makes it more salacious and also puts in the question, you know, what are what are you doing and why are why are you doing it? Why are you even engaging it? So it definitely brought a lot of questions into my mind, and you know, I, I still ruminate over it and I still go over it and and, one, and wonder where that line is, that that fine line is sometimes. Because even in the Steve Ditko book, uh, which was which I was written before I became a born again Christian, you know, there's some from those creepies and eeries. There's some interesting depictions of hell and, and craziness and things of that nature. And so I'm always questioning, uh, especially as I move forward, what do I want to see? What do I want my children to see? What would I want my church members to see? So definitely, definitely a question that I wrestled with and still continue to wrestle with. And Michael, as the guy who's got the huge collection in his basement of this stuff, I'm guessing you had less of an issue with it. Uh, I didn't ruminate at all. I <laughs> saw it and I said, people have to see this. Okay. All right. And uh, so I've got two more questions for you before we wrap it up. Uh, one is, uh, this is only sort of a question, but one of my favorite moments uh, in the book is when you describe uh, that uh, Submariner creator Bill Everett uh, and longtime comics writer and editor Denny O'Neill were made to pose for photos uh, used in Goodman's magazines. And I, I wondered if, if, if you guys uh, know what I'm talking about. If you could uh, describe what to, to, to viewers and listeners what, what happened there, Blake, you turn that up. <laughs> well, of course, as we know, especially as it got on into the '60s, Martin Goodman had all sorts of interesting publications, some of which uh, Michael was showing you there, and. Some of those magazines could recreate certain scenarios. A lot of the detective magazines would go down and take pictures of crime scenes and, and things of that nature. So yes, uh, sometimes because again, these all of this, the comic book and the, the alleged bullpen that was uh, existing in the '60s, 
just right down the hall could be all these other offices for all of other Martin Goodman publications. And if though if any of the comic book creators wander down the hall, they could get sucked into some of these fake photo shots and all of a sudden instead of being a comic book artist, you're some other kind of character. And we'll leave it to those uh, who want to read the book to discover exactly who Denny O'Neill and uh, Bill <laughs> Edward played. But it's uh, it's another fascinating secret in the secret history of Marvel Comics. Bob, those stage photos went as far back as 1941. Uh, we show Joe Simon posing uh, as a character in one of the early detective uh, magazines that he was the uh, uh, art director of. Well, I, let me say, folks, it's worth <laughs> it's worth digging into the book to find out what Bill Everett and uh, Denny O'Neill uh, played, particularly Denny. He, I, I gather he was not real happy that... Uh, his, his face was supposed to be hidden, and it was not. And I, I'll play along with you guys. I will not give away uh, how they were, de- what they were depicted as. But let's just say it was, uh, it was. A, hopefully, it's a bit of a stretch for both of them. Uh, well, I mean, I, it doesn't. Okay, let me take that back. It doesn't really matter, but I, I'm guessing it was a bit of a stretch for both of them. Um, all right. So my last question is this. And I, I, I again, something I feel like I have to ask you this. Uh, we talked earlier about. Uh, reprinting material and the secret history of Marvel Comics, uh, your new book, reprints at least at least a hundred pages, maybe more, of rare art and stories by many of the same creators that you write about, Martin Goodman ripping off. And I'm wondering how much you guys paid for the rights to reprint the same material. We didn't pay anything for the rights to the material. The works that we researched and looked at were public domain material. Uh, and similar to how we view the Steve Ditko archives and the Bill Everett archives is a little different. Uh, in that light, we put it out there from a historical perspective to try and maintain and, and preserve these types of works and put our effort into that. But you're hitting on another very valid question that goes out there today, Bob, in the in the media, which is uh, that conundrum again. What is represented? I, I brought that up, that issue up with Fanographics, and it's definitely a question question that continues to, to go onwards and continues to to really promote that dialogue uh, that you're speaking of. Okay. Michael, were you going to add something to that? or No, I, I believe pretty much covered what okay. I want to say also. All right. Well, um, folks, listen, you can find the secret history of Marvel Comics, written by my guests, Blake Bell and Michael Vassilo, in great bookstores everywhere, or order it right now at a great price at MrMedia.com. If you are watching the video, below the video, you should likely see uh, a copy of the, the cover of the book. You can click, click on it right now and order it from Amazon and have it, you could have it tomorrow if you like, maybe uh, more likely I, I would order it on two days, you know, save a little postage, but you do what you want. Um, and also, I will remind you that you can meet the authors uh, alongside comics artists Al Jaffe and Stan Goldberg at the official book release event for The Secret History of Marvel Comics on Saturday, October 12th at 7 p.m. That is hosted by the Society of Illustrators, and that event will be at 128 East 63rd Street in Manhattan. Uh, guys, is there a website? Is there a Twitter, Facebook for the book? How do people find you online? Yeah, we have a blog for the book, the Secret History Marvel Comics dot blogspot dot ca or dot com. We're publishing a ten part making of video series now on our Secret History Marvel Comics YouTube channel, and we also have a Facebook presence for the Secret History Marvel Comics as well. Wow, you got it all covered. Good for you guys. <laughs> Blake is also Mr. Media. I see that. Very good. Very good. I'll watch my back, and uh, just don't violate any copyrights, young man. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, Blake Bell and Mike Vassilo, it was uh, fascinating to read the book. Uh, I wish you much luck with the launch uh, in the coming week. And uh, thank you both so much for joining us on Mr. Media today. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for having us, Bob. You can see and hear almost a 1,000 Mr. Media interviews by visiting our main site, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com or check out the more than 200 video interviews on the Mr. Media Radio site on YouTube. And I'd sure appreciate if you'd show some love for Mr. Media's advertisers, including Stitcher. Apple named Stitcher a top five news app of 2011. It's a free mobile app for your smartphone or tablet that lets you listen to your favorite shows and discover the best of news, entertainment, and sports on demand. You can listen whenever you want to to more than 5,000 shows 
get customized recommendations, and discover what your friends are listening to. My own list of Stitcher favorites is pretty eclectic. I start my day with an hour of MSNBC's Morning Joe with Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski. Then it's the latest two-minute update from the Onion News Network. After that, I'll listen to WTF with Mark Marin. Here's The Thing with Alec Baldwin, HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher, and excerpts from E's Chelsea Lately and The Soup with Joel McHale. Also in regular rotation on my Stitcher playlist, The BS Report with ESPN's Bill Simmons, The Tech Crunch Headlines, and The Don Geronimo Show. The latest episodes of each show, whether originating from broadcasts, cable TV, radio syndication, or podcasts, are continuously updated. Stitcher is a free app for your iPhone, iPad, Kindle, Fire, BlackBerry, Droid, and more. And show your support of Mr. Media by getting, did I mention it's free? The app at stitcher.com slash Mr. Media. That's stitcher.com slash MR Media. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. We're also supported by Audible. Check out Audible's 30-day trial membership and download the audiobook version of the book everyone's been talking about, Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James. Sign up for your free trial today at audible.com slash radio. Again, audibletrial.com slash radio. And finally, if you need a disc jockey for a wedding, bar mitzvah, corporate event, or just a big old party, please consider calling 1-800-DIAL-DJs, the party authority, for all your party entertainment needs. You can call 1-800-DIAL-DJs or go to their website, 1-800-DIAL-DJs.com, and tell them Mr. Media sent you. And thanks for listening. Hi, this is Bob Greenberger, author of Star Trek, The Complete Unauthorized History, and many, many other books. And for the years, I've been talking about comic books and science fiction. I've been working in the field, and I'm now reduced to appearing on Mr. Media. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs>